let's pray. So, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you to pour forth your Holy Spirit, so that as we begin our course of studies, we may have open hearts to gain knowledge of our faith, to appreciate it more fervently, and to fall in a deeper love with you. May our Lord Jesus Christ truly be with us throughout this journey, and through the Holy Spirit, may we grow in wisdom and love. May our Blessed Mother, who was always open to your will, also be our help and our aid at this time. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the, name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome to the inquiry class. Once again, I'm not going to go through the roll tonight simply because we're running a little bit late, and rather than take up extra time doing that, we'll forgo that to another time. But good to see you all here. Now, just like with any course of studies, there's always some practical things to begin with. So hopefully in your package you have a syllabus, right? So in the syllabus we've broken down our series of lectures here and you'll notice that we have three texts involved, two of which you have received plus there is one little extra one. But the Life in Christ, LC, is a nice, succinct, clear, adult version of what we need to know as Catholics. So I enjoy this book. I've used it for many, many years now. It has gone through revisions, updates, especially with the new catechism. One thing I like about it is that it always gives the biblical references, also has some very good practical points. So as you look at the syllabus, when you have like for tonight, we're going to do who is God, how do we know God, we have LC, pages 1 through 125, it's referring to this book, Life in Christ. But then also we have the compendium. Now, the compendium is exactly that of a larger book, which you did not receive for free, called The Catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, quite frankly, every sincere Catholic ought to have one of these books. Because, along with sacred scripture, meaning the Bible, this is the next source of, of information that we ought to have. This is a wonderful book. And actually, since the early days of the church, we've had catechisms. So, you could say textbooks to help explain the faith. The first catechism actually was written probably about the year 80. It's called the Didache, the teachings attributed to the 12 apostles. And that book had pretty much four parts to it. It had a doctrine section, a sacramental section, so how we've done baptism you'll find there. Or as far as basics of the mass, it's there. There's a moral section and also there is a spirituality section. Well that basic book then gave rise to other catechisms. One of the most popular in recent times was the Catechism of the Council of Trent, the Roman Catechism. And then in America, in the 1800s, we had the Baltimore Catechism that several of us know from growing up. It was a basic catechetical means for learning the faith. Well, in 1992, Pope John Paul II published this catechism. So it was an updated version. You think that since the, let's say, late 1800s especially, different things had gone on in the world. So some of it hasn't changed. So the Apostles' Creed hasn't changed. But especially the moral section. So the moral issues, like in this catechism, looking at the moral section, looking at the Ten Commandments, you'll find a discussion on nuclear war, for instance, or bioethics issues. So this is a wonderful text to have. Matter of fact, I remember when it was released back in 1992, 
Pat Robertson on his, was it the, PT, was it the PTL club or something or something like that? PL, what? PTL club. Held this up and said, what a wonderful book this is. Everyone should have one of these. Because if you look at this book, you see a continuum of our faith. You have in the back indices the references to sacred scripture, but then also the official council documents and teachings, like that of Nicaea and so on. The teachings of the different popes, the different saints, and so on. It is simply a wonderful resource of the faith. Everything we believe, really, is right here. So you have sacred scripture, the Bible, you have this catechism. Really, there you have it. So if you don't have one, you ought to get one. But to make life easier for people, because this could be a little intimidating, Pope Benedict, before he was actually Pope Benedict, right before he was elected actually, with the authority of John Paul II back then, released the compendium, which is a synopsis of this. The nice thing about the compendium is it is brief, that's one thing. It does have a lot of the practical aspects like prayers and so on in it. But then also, one of the good parts is artwork and the idea of catechesis through art. So it has these wonderful examples of art and behind each one is an explanation of what it means. One reason why we have such beautiful art in our church is because it helps teach the faith. That's what it's always been about. So, anyway, so you do have a compendium. So if you look at your syllabus again, compendium is exactly what it is. CCC is Catechism of the Catholic Church. For those of you who really want to know more, go to the Catechism. So, and then I also gave to each of you another simple book. It's called Outlines of the Catholic Faith. So again, something simple, yet Good, and one thing that I like about this is it has a lot of the practical points to it, like how do you go to confession, make the sign of the cross, say the rosary, things of that nature. Okay, so those are our resource materials. Now, of course, we also have the Bible. So if you don't have a Bible, you ought to get one, and I would recommend two. Probably the most accessible as well as the best printed right now is called the Ignatius Bible. It's printed by the Ignatius Press, but it's the Revised Standard Version. Now, there's a caution here. Back about 1997, the Bible publishers decided to get with it, so they wanted to update language and sometimes politicize that, so neuter language. So some of our common phrasing was lost. So there was the new revised standard version. And remember there's that phrase where Jesus says to the apostles, go out and I will make you fishers of men. Well, the politically correct people didn't like that. So they changed it to, I will make you fish for people. Well, you can interpret that as St. Peter turning into a tuna or something. I will make you fish for people. So. I don't like the new Revised Standard Version, so this is the original Revised Standard Version. Along that caution, I like the old New American Bible. If you get the Revised New American Bible, or the new New American Bible, <laughs> don't get it. So, but if you can find the old New American Bible, it's a very good book. So, there you have it, but you ought to have a Bible and we will make references to the different passages in the Bible, so bring it along, okay? So we have that. The course outline is pretty clear, so pretty much during the scheme work here, we start with who is God, how do we know God? We will go through the creedal section, so as far as the sources of revelation, Trinity, creation, Jesus, who Jesus is, what Jesus did for us, the church, and then Mary and the saints, last things, heaven, hell, purgatory. And that pretty much will take us through the fall, up till Christmas. And that is really a survey of the creed. And that's the first section of the catechism. It's the largest section. 
Then when we come back after Christmas, we go through the sacraments. And then after that, we get into the moral issues and also the spiritual life. We end up in the middle of March. And then for those who are at that point desiring to enter into the Catholic Church, you would do so at the Easter Vigil, which this year is April the 3rd. Okay? So, so far, so good, I think. Right? Right? Good? Okay. Now, with that, you should also have received a little inquiry class information sheet. This is especially important for me as far as just so that we can contact you. So like email addresses or telephone numbers and so on, but especially as far as baptism information and marriage information, if you are not Catholic, but you might be thinking about becoming Catholic, it's important that I have that information now just so that I can make sure if you're baptized or not, and also if you're married or not, and so on, okay? So you can fill that in, you can return that next week. Also, especially if you might be thinking about becoming Catholic, there's a little study guide here, basics every Catholic should know, as far as the basic prayers, and then also just the topics that we're going to go through, so you can pay special attention to these questions and perhaps fill them out, take notes and so on as we move along through the course. Okay, so far so good. Okay, good. Now, next thing is, as far as the class goes, it's a fun class. I really do enjoy teaching this class because one, you're adults. <laughs> and it's a, lot, it's a lot easier teaching adults than it is kids at times because I'm used to teaching kids quite a bit, but I've always enjoyed teaching adults. So, because you have a better appreciation of life in a sense. The second part of it is, it's always fun being able to talk about faith. You know, as a priest, I have fun doing this. Believe it or not, I do. So, it really is fun and I enjoy talking about faith. So, don't be afraid to ask questions. I've heard it all. Pretty much. You can't surprise me and you can't offend me. So if you have a question, do not be afraid to ask that question. Okay? And also, don't feel like maybe you're asking a silly question or a dumb question because I'm sure someone else is thinking of that same question. It's also good because every now and then I might forget to cover a certain little topic or an aspect. So the point that you're raising also helps me. So don't be afraid to ask questions. Just don't get off track. Once I had someone in this class a few years ago, and I'd be talking about, let's say, the church, and he wanted to talk about euthanasia. You now, let's try to just stay on the topic. I mean, that helps me out too, so we don't get distracted. The other point is that in this course, there's something that we remember. It's really a journey in love. And I was looking through the catechism, just reviewing once again to think about how we start all of this class and so on. And it's always important to remember what this is all about. And in the big catechism, as it starts the section on the creed, it has a quote. And it's from the, first, or from the Second Vatican Council which was back in the early 60s. And the quote is, the dignity of man rests above all on the fact that he is called to communion with God. This invitation to converse with God is addressed to man as soon as he comes into being. For if man exists, it is because God has created him through love. And through love continues to hold him in existence. How can we not live fully according to truth unless he freely acknowledges that love, that love, and entrusts himself to his creator. So what we're doing here is really a journey in love. That we have a God who loves us so much, who has made himself known, and poor little human beings that we are, are called to share in that love. So as you go through these readings, and hopefully you'll keep up with that, and even listen through these courses and so on, Look at it as a prayer. 
St. Dominic said that study is prayer. That's a good way to look at life or look at our journey here because prayer isn't simply like meditation or say saying the rosary or formal prayers. It is study because we're opening our mind up to truths and God through his grace is drawing us into a closer, deeper relationship. So look upon this as a time of prayer where you can get to know God more and moreover fall in love more with God. That's really what it's about. So with that we begin and we begin with who is God? Good place to start, right? So here we have God. Now if you look at your sheet here, attributes of God as found in sacred scripture. We could look at different adjectives to try to describe God. And there's all kinds of attributes, right? But here's some that we do find in sacred scripture. So for instance, God is all loving. So we have come to know and to believe in the love God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. God is all merciful. With age old love I have loved you so I have kept my mercy towards you. Even when people sin, throughout the Old Testament we find people sinning against God in abominable ways really and yet God always was merciful. He never stopped loving them. And then God is all-knowing. So he is omniscient. God too is unchangeable. That is, he is perfect. God is all-just. God is infinite, so he has no boundaries, no limitations. God is eternal, not made. God always is, always was, always will be. God is all-powerful, so he's omnipotent. God is everywhere. So he is omnipresent. So he is with us now. He is with people in Great Britain. If I pray in union with God tonight, so can you. God is omnipresent. Now, you can look at these attributes and read them on your own. These are just different attribute selections throughout sacred scripture. But pretty much this is a classical kind of definition of God. This all-loving, all-merciful, all-knowing, omniscient, perfect, all-just, infinite, eternal, all-powerful, omnipresent, everywhere God. Now, hopefully, immediately, you see there's a problem here. And the problem is, what does this really mean? We can't grasp it. We cannot grasp what, for instance, all-knowing is. What's all-knowing? Even if we said, that God knows everything as the Britannia book of encyclopedias. Well, that can change tomorrow, right? Some new piece of knowledge is there. So God, we can't comprehend what all-knowing is. We can't comprehend all-powerful. What's all-powerful? Is it as powerful as a nuclear blast? Is it as powerful as some kind of a missile? What would it be? We can't comprehend all-powerful or even eternal. We're so locked into past, present, and future, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, how can we possibly comprehend eternity? And yet these are the words that we use. So even though they're good words, we immediately see we're limited as human beings. So you think, here we go, little old mankind over here, Are we all loving? No, we know that, right? Just look at the newspaper. We are not all loving. 
Are we all merciful? No. Are we all knowing? We might like to think so, especially some of our elected officials, but we are not all knowing, right? Are we perfect? No, we aren't perfect. Are we all just? Definitely not. Are we infinite? No, we're bound by hunger, gravity, time. Are we eternal? No, we are born into this world. We're created. And at some point, this physical being called a body dies. Yes, we have an immortal soul, but even that's created. So we are not eternal. Are we all powerful? No. Muammar Gaddafi might think he's all powerful, but no, we are not all powerful. Are we omnipresent? No, we're stuck here. We're here. Some of us, if we're really holy, might have the gift of biolocation, but even that, you're biolocating, you aren't everywhere. And are we, so that covers that, are we omnipotent, all powerful? We covered that. So, we aren't this. So we've got a problem here, right? How then can we know God? Now, We would have to think that if we are faithful people, we also want to be reasonable people. So we use reason, a gift of the intellect. Is it reasonable then to believe in God? Or through the powers of reason, can we know there is a God? So can we say, can we use reason to prove God exists? Good question. Because there are those atheists who would say, no. You know, atheists would say there is no God. Atheists deny the existence of God. And then you have the agnostics who really are cowards. They sit on the fence. They say you can neither prove God nor disprove God, but really they're practical atheists because they don't want to believe in God. So you have agnostics and atheists, but they're really all atheists. So they say, no, you can't prove the existence of God. It's always amazing how much time atheists trying to try to disprove God. You know, why are they so busy trying to disprove God if there really wasn't a God? You should ask an atheist that sometime. Why does it really matter to you if there's no God? Why are you so concerned? But they are for some reason. Now, could we use some kind of argument from reason to do so? Now, you will find also in your package this nice little handout that I used to use when I taught college theology way back when. Arguments from reason concerning the existence of God. But we're just, you can read that on your own, but we're going to go through them now. And I would say one of the arguments is the argument from what I call history. When you think about history, in every age, in every time period, every culture, there's been a belief in God. Some kind of a God. Something beyond ourselves. So if you look at anthropological studies, and even at this point, if you go to some let's say culture, maybe some aborigines kind of society, there's still going to be a belief in a supernatural power, some kind of a being other than ourself. For some reason, there's something within ourselves, human beings, that have always had a longing for God. We've never discounted that. So one argument for can we use reason to prove God exists is, that within us, in the depths of our intellect, there's always been this longing for something, some God, some power beyond us. Now maybe that's been manifested in different ways. So you think of how some cultures had this pantheon of gods and so on. But they all were trying to capture some absolute power beyond themselves. So, history. Another way to look at it is from what I call the argument of the ideal. We look to truth principles. And this is so important, especially in our world today, because in some sense we've lost it. Do we believe in truth principles? Do we believe in principles of like beauty? Or 
of justice or of what is good. You know, what is good? What is beautiful? What is true? What is love? Human beings, using their intellect, have always said, yes, there is a standard of justice. That's why when you think of, again, cultures, whether Judeo-Christian or some other culture, stealing's wrong. We know that. Intellectually, we know stealing is wrong. Or murdering someone is wrong. We know that. Using reason, we know that. Or that committing adultery. If you're committed to a spouse, you're married, adultery is wrong. It's repugnant. We have that innate knowledge that that's repugnant. It's a wrong action. Or that lying is wrong. And we could go on and on. Yes, as Christians, and if we were Jews, we could say, yes, those are in the Ten Commandments. But any reasonable human being can come up with those truth principles that cut along lines. Well, where do those come from? There has to be a wisdom in which they reside. Or you think of even as far as the idea of other principles by which we live as far as beauty. What is beautiful? It reflects really some kind of a reflection of creation. Or we look at ourselves. So there's a standard by which we live. There's a standard of justice. That's why if you look at some of the great champions of justice, they always went back to those principles and they made that step to God. Like when Abraham Lincoln was debating about slavery, he said slavery was wrong, not because of politics, not because of some economics. He said slavery is wrong because it's wrong. It violates the dignity of the human being. It cuts across any kind of cultural restriction or anything like that. It's wrong because it denies the dignity of the human being. When you think of principles of why is segregation wrong, it denies the dignity of the human being. There are these standards of justice, of truth, by which we live that don't depend upon us voting on it. Because after all, you know, we could vote on something and we could vote on and say, well, we should have slavery, right? We could. We could vote on something and say, well, we should eliminate the Jews. Remember, those two, those two moral issues that I just talked about were all democratically enacted legislation. At times, in our country, other countries, there was legalized slavery. People voted on that. And in Nazi Germany, people voted and enacted the Nuremberg Laws, which eliminated the Jews. So it's not a matter of voting on it, is it? It's wrong because there's a set of truths that say it's wrong. But where does that reside, then? There has to be a wisdom, an ideal, as Plato would say, in which this resides, a wisdom of God. Ponder that. Very important, because so many people today don't understand truth. They don't have that idea. It's all relative. This is why morals are so confused today. So many young people have a relativistic notion. It's all about what I think. Well, it's up to, if it's up to me what I think is right or wrong, we're all in trouble. There has to be a principle, a standard, an objective universal principle of truth. For instance, I'll give you a quick example. When I was teaching at Marymount, I, there's this conversation outside my office. I heard about it. it. had to deal with premarital sex. So bingo, I just decided to join in. So anyway, this one fellow who happened to be African American was saying that he was, he didn't see anything wrong with it. And this other person who was involved in my campus ministry group said, yes, there is something wrong with it. And he and this one fellow said, well, what's right for you is right for you, but what's right for me is right for me, and who am I to impose my morals on you, and vice versa, and so on. 
So I said to Damon, that was the guy's name, I said Damon, he's a very bright boy. So I said, Damon, let's think about it. What about slavery? Because I knew that would affect, you know, really, being African American, that would be a sensitive issue. So I said, what about slavery? What if I said, I'm for slavery? If it's right for me, then how can you say I'm wrong? Is it wrong? He said, of course it's wrong. I said, why is it wrong? If what's right for you is right for you, and what's right for me is right for me, why is it wrong? You know, is the Civil War just a matter of the Union had more, you know, munitions and soldiers and so on, and that's why slavery is defeated, or is it wrong because it's wrong? Ha-ha, it's wrong because it's wrong. It defies a truth about the human being. And so we have to think then that there is an ideal, that any reasoning person who really has an intellectual set is going to say there has to be a standard of justice, of beauty, of goodness that is based on a truth. A truth that isn't up to me, to personal whim, a truth that is timeless. A truth that resides in a wisdom, capital W wisdom of God. Thirdly, third argument, we could call the argument of first cause. Everything has to have a beginning, you know, when you think about it. Logically, everything has a beginning. There has to be some beginning point. So when you think about us, I was caused by my parents, let's say, and my parents were caused by their parents, and their parents were caused by their parents. And you go back in time. Eventually, there has to be a beginning. There has to be a first person, right? If you have a plant, plant came from a seed, came from plant, came from a seed, boom. Eventually, there has to be a first plant. There has to be a beginning. Logically, there has to be something that was not caused by anything else, but something that caused everything else. That has to be God, by definition. God who is eternal, all-powerful, all-wise. So the God who is all-wise, all-powerful, caused everything else. The argument of first cause. First put forth by Aristotle in the year 300 BC. Aristotle was a pagan, but he believed in one true God. He believed in a supreme being, whom he called the first mover. So Aristotle had all these qualities for God. And Aristotle said, logically, there has to be a God, one supreme, all-powerful, eternal being, who set everything into motion, caused everything else. Well, that is God. Now Thomas Aquinas, the great theologian who lived in the early 1200s, 1225, 1274, put this adapted Aristotle and used that as a basis for several of his arguments to prove the existence of God using reason. Next argument. And this is the argument from design. We look at the world today. Is the world chaotic? I mean, not looking at what we do, but looking the way the world is. Is it chaotic? No. Everything is structured. It's designed. This human body is a wonderful gift. When you think about it, what a design it has. So like right now, maybe the good old stomach's still processing our dinner, and the kidneys are purifying blood, oxygen's going into the lungs, and that's going into the blood, the heart is pumping the blood, the brain is working, and think of that, that the brain is enabling me right now not only to have all those processes continue on, but also I can move my hands, and I can give my facial expressions. I can have language that is totally unique. I can think. I'm not like a little robot here. What a wonderful gift this body is. And yet it works. And you look at not only the body of a man, we have a body of a woman. And they work together to bring about life. Did that just happen by chance? Or you look at just what's happening in our little society right now. We're going from summer, and officially we're 
in the fall now, but we're going to move to winter, and then we come to spring, and it starts again. And we know that the sun goes down, moon comes up, sun goes up, so on and so forth. Day starts and night starts and so on. And it happens. And the planets are revolving in their course. Everything is designed. Everything has a purpose. We look at this creation and we say, it just didn't happen. There had to be a wisdom behind this that designed this universe, designed everything. And we could also say, gave life, because that's a mystery in itself. You can't just put a bunch of chemicals together and come up with life, especially our life as human beings. Or you think of things like even bees. I love bees. Never notice bees? Bees have those nice little hives, little honeycombs, right? And what do they make? Perfect hexagons. Or not, yes, hexagons. It's an engineering wonder, and that's a bee. Or you look at how many different kinds of flowers there are. I grow roses. I love looking at roses. Because you look at them and you think, what a gift. What a beautiful gift a rose is. And that's just one flower. Who could have possibly created such a rose? So you ponder, ponder creation, and you see a design, a purpose, and an order. Even when you think about other things, like when you think of music, true music, good music, <clears throat> good music is very methodical, isn't it? When you think about scales and intervals and harmony, it's all very logical. And Pythagoras spoke about that. And Pythagoras spoke about how everything fits into number patterns and so on. Very designed. Or you think of what beauty really is. Isn't beauty something that reflects creation? You know, in the Renaissance, like Leonardo da Vinci, we've all seen that little image of like a man who's like this, right? And so on. Because he took our body and everything was in proportion. And that's how they designed buildings then. Everything was in proportion. It make, there's a design. There's a harmony, a purpose. Isn't it interesting, though, in our world today where so many people call themselves atheists or have forgotten about God? That's when we get into the pictures like Jackson Pollock throwing paint against a wall or something. Where's the beauty there? No real beauty, is there? Anybody can throw paint against a wall. Or you look at Frank Gehry. Have you ever heard of him, the architect? Where he takes toilet tissue paper, lets it drop, and then he designs a building. And that's how you got the art museum in Balboa, Spain, and you have the center in Los Angeles and so on. No proportion. Very expensive, ugly. So, yeah. So, but things that are beautiful reflect creation and proportion and design. It makes sense. So, the argument from design. Again, Aristotle used that to say there has to be a God. This all-knowing God. And this, again, was picked up by St. Thomas Aquinas and Christianized into proving God. Now, last argument is the argument from what we call amusement. This is an interesting one. And if you look at your little sheet here on the back, this was put forth by a Charles Sanders Peirce. Looks like Pierce, but it's really Peirce. And he was an American philosopher, lived at the turn of the 1900s, taught at Harvard, and a pragmatist. So he looked at the logic behind things. And he wouldn't say a Christian or anything like that, but he did believe in God. It's a rather interesting argument that he calls from amusement. He says, I have often occasion to walk at night for about a mile over an entirely untraveled road, much of it between open field without a house in sight. The circumstances are not favorable to severe study, but are so to calm meditation. If the sky is clear, I look at the stars in the silence, thinking how each successive increase in the aperture of a telescope makes many more of them visible than all that had been visible before. 
the fact that the heavens do not show a sheet of light proves that there are vastly more dark bodies, say planets, than there are suns. For on the whole, the solar system seems one of the simplest, and presumably under more complicated phenomena, greater intellectual power will be developed. We cannot appreciate our own powers any more than a writer can appreciate his own style or a thinker the peculiar quality of his own thought. Let a man drink in such thoughts as come to him in contemplating the physico-psychical universe without any special purpose of his own, especially the universe of mind which coincides with the universe of matter. The idea of there being a God over it all, of course, will be often suggested. And the more he considers it, the more he will be enwrapped with love. Notice capital L, love of this idea. He'll ask himself whether or not there really is a God. If he allows instinct to speak and searches his own heart, he will at length find that he cannot help believing it. Well, think of that. Go out sometime. Ponder creation. Ponder how everything works. And our hearts will be moved to God. To a God who is the supreme wisdom, who's all-powerful, who put the design purpose and order into it. Now it's interesting, some of the greatest scientists have had the same ideas. You take these two arguments, actually you could take three, first cause, design, amusement, put them together, and Albert Einstein believed in God. Now Albert Einstein was Jewish, culturally, but not a practicing Jew, but nevertheless he had those, that background. And he, just a couple of quotes from Albert Einstein. He said, my religion consists of a humble admiration of the illimitable superior spirit who reveals himself in the slight details we are able to perceive with our frail and feeble minds. That deeply emotional conviction of the presence of a superior reasoning power, which is revealed in the incomprehensible universe, forms my idea of God. I want to know God and how he created this world. I'm not interested in this or that phenomenon, in the spectrum of this or that element. I want to know his thoughts. The rest are details. The human mind is not capable of grasping the universe. We are like a little child entering a huge library. The walls are covered to the ceilings with books in many different tongues. The child knows that someone must have written these books. It does not know who or how. It does not understand the languages in which they are written. But the child notes a definite plan in the arrangement of the books, a mysterious order which it does not comprehend but only dimly suspects. So Albert Einstein, a scientist, knew there was a God. Warner Von Braun, who was Another great scientist was really the, one of the fathers of our space program. He developed the Saturn rocket. And so, and actually, I have a, you could say, an affinity towards Warner Von Braun because my father knew him. My father worked for NASA, and actually, somewhere in my files, I have an autographed picture of Warner Von Braun. So, may be that as it may. Warner Von Braun said this. I find it as difficult to understand a scientist who does not acknowledge the presence of a superior rationality behind the existence of the universe as it is to comprehend a theologian who would deny the advances of science. And there is certainly no scientific reason why God cannot retain the same relevance in our modern world that he held before we began probing his creation with telescope, cyclotron, and space vehicles. Now, another quote from Dr. Warner Von Braun. Dr. Von Braun said, Can a physicist visualize an electron? The electron is materially inconceivable, and yet it is so perfectly known through its effects that we use it to illuminate our cities, guide our airlines through the night skies, and take the most accurate measurements. What strange rationale makes some physicists accept the inconceivable electron as real while refusing to accept the reality of God on the ground that they cannot conceive him? When a man almost 2,000 years ago was given the opportunity to know Jesus Christ, 
to know God who had decided to live for a while as a man amongst fellow men in this little planet, our world was turned upside down through the widespread witness of those who heard and understood him. That same miracle can happen again if only all men will accept Christ. Although I know of no reference to Christ ever commenting on scientific work, I do know that he said, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Thus I am certain that were he visibly among us today, Christ would encourage scientific research and modern man's most noble striving to comprehend and admire his father's handiwork. In this reaching of the new millennium through faith in the words of Jesus Christ, science can be a valuable tool rather than an impediment. My relationship with God is very personal. I think you can be on first name terms with him you know and tell him what your troubles are and ask for help. I do it all the time and it works for me. A scientist. So the key is here that if you look at first cause design and amusement, you can believe in God without question. And we don't have a conflict with, let's say, science and belief. Now, a couple of things here though. Does all this make sense? Yes? Yes, yes good. All right, good. Right, now, is anything lacking? in this. Now we've just covered a whole semester practically in a few minutes here. But are you satisfied with this or do you want more? Yes? I do have a question about from reason. Um, you didn't mention Pascal's wager. There's a, there's, a, there's a terrible consequence potentially if you don't believe that. This is true. <laughs> so, so which way are you going to bet? Exactly. Yeah. Very no, it doesn't, does it? And neither, really, if this is all you're happy with, let's call it quits now, in a way. Because while this says that through reason we can say God exists, so Aristotle, Plato, and then you get into the Christians like Aquinas and so on, Augustine, would use these arguments to say, yes, we can posit God exists using reason, we aren't left with a very personable God a God we can love. That's the problem here. We don't have a God who is going to love us in a sense and that we can love God. So while this is reason and this is good, and we can say yes God exists and tell the atheist go take a hike, nevertheless it doesn't leave us with a very personable God. So where do we go? Well, this is where revelation comes in. So we believe that God so loves us that he revealed himself. So God makes himself known. So revelation. God communicates to us himself. And God, in so doing, is also identifying himself not only by these qualities, so these adjectives. God is identifying himself by those nouns. God is the truth. God is the beauty. So what is beauty? God is the beautiful. God is good. God is justice. God is love. So God is the one who personifies those terms. So when we think about the beauty of creation, the design of creation, we see the wisdom of God. It's a revelation of God's wisdom. Now, so God sends a little spark of grace to open up our hearts to receive this message. And so, human beings that we are, we have a choice. God doesn't force us to love him. Now you could place the bet if you want to, you know, that's one way. But, more honestly, hopefully we open up our hearts. And yes, we could start here, but eventually we have to open our hearts to love and say yes to that love. And that's what God does for us. And we respond if we believe in what we call faith. Now, when we look at it, that in the course of salvation history, so now we're just going to do like a little schema of how this course is going to unfold. If we look at what we would call the Old Testament then, God reveals himself to Adam and Eve. So there is the creation account, 
and then God makes himself known to our first parents, Adam and Eve, first man, first woman, and God shares his life and his love with them. They sin, but God still loves, and he continues to reveal himself. So we have the covenant made with Abraham. God says to Abraham, I will be your God. I'll give you land, children, prosperity. You'll love me as your God. And he makes a covenant, a bonding of life and love. Then the Jewish people are slaves in Egypt. God reveals himself to Moses and again to the Jewish people. The Jewish people are freed from slavery. The covenant is renewed. God gives them the Ten Commandments, his truth how to live life. So not that they can just, they have to use their reason to come up with thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. God specifically tells them those commandments. So all, and we go through the whole Old Testament, God is making himself known. And God who is all love never stops loving. Even though these people of the Old Testament sin, God still loves them. But we've got a gap here still. Because nowhere in this Old Testament does anyone ever see God. They hear God. God communicates to them. But we don't see God. So we have a communication gap. And one has to think that if God is all of this, and we're so different, how do we bridge the communication gap? How can we, as poor little human beings, possibly really grasp God? And yes, God is making himself known. God speaks to Abraham, Moses, and so on. But to have that full, intimate communication really would take someone who has all of the attributes of God and yet all the attributes of a human being. And that's the mystery of Christ. That God so loves us that he sends Jesus into this world. That true God becomes also true man. So Jesus, who is a divine person with all these attributes, also becomes a human being with all of our attributes, except, of course, sin. So Christ solves the revelation gap. So Christ perfectly reveals God, the truth, the beauty, the goodness, the justice, the love of God. Now remember in the gospel, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He personifies that. But it doesn't stop there, because we know chronologically Jesus dies in the year 33 AD. So what happens? Well, Christ founded a church to carry on his mission. And Christ also, in union with the Father, pours forth the Holy Spirit to guide this church. Now, one thing we have to think of here then is that when we think of our relationship with God, it's not simply about me and God. It's about us and God. Because here, when we look at these stories of the covenant and s with Abraham and Moses, you have the Jewish people as the chosen people, right? They're the people of God. So it's not just to Abraham, not just to Moses, it's to the chosen people, the people of the covenant, the people of God. So in the same way, church is very important. It's not simply about I believe it's about we believe. And that's why in the creed we can say, I believe, but as a church we say, we believe. It involves all of us. The revelation continues on through the Holy Spirit and the church in what we call sacred scripture. So the Bible, the word of God, but also what we call the apostolic tradition. Not tradition in the sense of like customs or ritual. Tradition in the sense of the handing on of the teachings. It comes from the Latin traditio, to hand on. So it's the handing on of the teachings 
of what Christ has revealed, what we have believed as a church since that time. Guided by the Holy Spirit, we understand, we believe, we preserve that truth. So, we'll talk more about this next week, sacred scripture and apostolic tradition. But before we end, just one other little point. When we think about faith, what is faith? So faith, in a sense, is a gift from God. God gives us the little shot of grace, and God has made himself known. We say freely, I believe. So it's a free act of our will. We aren't forced to believe. So it's an act of love that we commit ourselves to God, inspired by his grace. It is an acceptance of God's truth. So when we talk about faith, we are saying, I believe, and I be accept, and I submit my intellect and my will to God's truth. This faith also is put into action. So we live our faith. It's not simply saying, I believe and not living it. We live it. We follow the commandments. We do the good works of God and so on. It's also a foretaste of heaven that we share our life now with God and we look forward to having that life fulfilled in heaven. When this faith is fulfilled in vision, that's the key. In heaven, we will see God face to face. So the faith we have now comes to perfection, is fulfilled in heaven when we see God face to face. All right, so that's sort of the schema. Now what we're going to do next week is talk specifically about the revelation. And that is, we're going to talk about sacred scripture, the Bible, how it was formed, who wrote it, and so on. And also talk about apostolic tradition. Okay? So one good thing would be is if next week you do bring your Bibles. So, alrighty. Any questions? Okay. Then we shall see you next week. All right? Have a good evening. If you have any questions, you can see me after class and try to catch up on your reading. You're already officially behind. Ha 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 ha. Just like college, right? And we'll go from there. <laughs>